Thank you for joining us. We hope that you enjoyed today's service. God is using the ministry of Lakeside to make a difference in many people's lives, and we have heard numerous stories of life change. If God has used the ministry of Lakeside to make a difference in your life, we would love to hear your story. Please email us at amen at lakesidechurch.ca. All right, so uh, what we're doing this morning, we are continuing on in our series looking at the lyrics of, of famous Christmas songs, songs that we all know, songs that we can probably sing on autopilot, um, but what we really want to do here is really dig in deep to the words of these songs. I think we can so often take them for granted because we sing them so often or because they kind of come up every year. We want them to be so much more than just a seasonal song. You know, we really want to talk about the truths that are in these songs. Now, rather than look at kind of isolated lyrics, I know kind of the last two weeks we've been, we've been taking almost a section of the song or some very specific lyrics. We're not going to do that today. We're actually going to look at a whole song. So it's going to be a little ambitious. Um, we're still going to pick apart the lyrics, but what we actually want to talk about with the song we're doing today is we really want to look at the theme of what this song is all about. So if you have caught on, we are doing O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. It is by far my favorite Christmas song. Um, I get to sit in on the planning meetings for the Lakeside Christmas Eve services, and without fail, every year I request this song to varying degrees of success. But uh, it is my absolute favorite song. Anyone else favorite song? Anyone? Okay, well, got one or two. I'm weird. Um, I, and I say that under, like, I'm not sure what it says about us because oddly enough, this song is not particularly a happy song. It's actually meant and written as a lament. So the word rejoice does appear 10 times in this song, but this is actually meant as a cry to God. This is a people begging for freedom. There is certainly hope in this song. There is the promise of a savior. There's a promise that there's going to be an end to suffering, but this song is written from that place of suffering. The words actually go back to the 12th century, and it is very much a Christmas song. It recognizes the birth of Jesus as the Savior, but it's very purposefully written in Old Testament language, so pre-Christmas language. We are meant to hear the nation Israel, the Jewish people, God's chosen people of the Old Testament, calling out for their Messiah, for their Savior. This is a song of, pe of, of people saying, God, come rescue us. Fulfill your promise to us. Emmanuel means God with us. It is, there will only be an end to our suffering when God is here with us, when his promise is fulfilled. That's what this song is all about. And this idea of Israel and their relationship with God and them being saved by God, it runs throughout the entirety of the Bible, but predominantly in the Old Testament. And we are going to be ambitious today. We are going from Genesis 12 to the book of Revelation. So if you know your Bible, that means we're starting in the first book and we're going to the last book. So we are going to be digging into it. But this promise actually starts in Genesis 12, so very near the beginning of the Bible. And God promises a man named Abraham, not a young man, he's a man who's 75 years old at this time. He promises Abraham that Abraham is going to be the father of a great nation, that God is going to bless this nation, and that this nation will bless other people through, like, because God has blessed them, they will be a blessing to others. That's what it's going to be. And eventually we learn that this nation will be called Israel. And God seals this promise, this promise of a great nation, with a covenant. So this covenant means that God has promised his people this, and he gives them a sign saying, I am going to keep my promise to you. And this covenant is actually referred to in Genesis 17 as an everlasting covenant. This covenant will have no end. God will always keep this promise that this will be his people. These people will be his. And the Israelites do not have an easy beginning. They are a nomadic people. As their numbers start growing, they're very quickly put into slavery. They stay in slavery for 400 years. They are depressed and oppressed, and they are dehumanized. And yet, 
through all of this, we see that God is incredibly faithful to them. The Bible says that God hears their cries and he comes and he rescues them. He fulfills his promise to these people. And as the Old Testament goes along, we see the rise of the nation Israel. They become a very numerous nation. They become one of the most powerful nations in the world. They are a nation that is richly, richly blessed. Men and women come from all over the ancient world to seek the wisdom of their kings. They want to go and they want to see their temple. They want to visit the place where God dwells with his people. They are unbelievably wealthy. This is a nation that is prospering. And it might look, if you kind of did a snapshot of about the middle of the Old Testament, it might look like the nation Israel has it all together. They have this power and this wealth and this status. But they also have this very systemic problem that we see time and time again in the Old Testament. When they are doing well, so when everything's going good, they're like, look at us. Look at how great we are. Look at all the things that we've done. When they win battles, they're like, look at how victorious we are. Look at how mighty we are. When they gather wealth, look at how rich we are. Look at how we have made ourselves prosper. They forget about the poor, the marginalized, the disenfranchised. They forget that every single blessing they have is a gift from God. They take all glory away from God and says, nope, we did it all ourselves. This is all on us, and they worship foreign gods, and they mingle with foreign nations, and they make treaties with nations they're not supposed to make treaties with so they can get some more power, and they bypass God completely. And God, you can imagine, is not too happy with this because he is the reason for their success, and he alone is the reason for their success. And God wants his people to have a heart after his own heart. So he sends these prophets. He sends messengers to his people. And they are screaming out these warnings to people. And they're like, you have to turn back to God. You need a heart that is after God's own heart. That is what he desires more than anything. We need to get back to the law. We need to follow after God, to repent completely of giving the glory to ourselves and give all the glory to God. And the prophet's messages work to varying degrees, sometimes kind of well. It never gets really above kind of well. So God just says, okay, you know what? I'm going to do something to get their attention, something so that they will listen to me. And what he does is that he strips them of nearly everything they have, every blessing that he has given them that they took the credit for. God says, well, watch what happens when I take it away from you. Nearly everything. He always left them with something. But what he's trying to do here is for them to recognize their utter dependence on him, that he is the giver of every good thing. And this happens several times in the Old Testament. A cycle of they're doing well and forget about God. God takes stuff away. They come back to God. They do well again. And it's a cycle. It goes over and over again. And if, if you're like me sometimes, and it's not a good attitude to have, it's kind of judgmental, I'm kind of slapping my head and being like, have you not seen everything God has done for you people? How can you not turn back to him after seeing everything he has done for for you. And yet we see this cycle time and time again. And there are other nations that God uses to help make his point. And other nations like uh, Babylon and Assyria and the Romans, they rise to power and they take control over the nation Israel. They, they basically take a control of these people. And once again, the people are oppressed. And another nation is ruling them. Now throughout all of this, we have the prophets who are giving the warnings, but the prophets are also doing something else. They're also giving a promise. They're saying that, yes, God wants to teach you a lesson, but God will never forget the promise that he made to you that was sealed with an everlasting covenant. He will never forget this. And the prophets promise that one is coming. An individual is coming who will restore Israel. 
And this, this individual, if you look at the words of O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, it's often called the rod of Jesse or the key of David. It is going to come from David's line. And this promised one would redeem the people. He would break oppression and he would bring the people back to him. Isaiah, these are some of the descriptors that Isaiah uses of who this individual will be. He will be born of a virgin. He will be born in the city of David, also known as Bethlehem. He will be a light to the people living in darkness. He will break oppression and, or the yoke of oppression that the people struggle under. He will rule on David's throne, Israel's throne forever. He will bear the weight of sin of his, of his people. He will bring res restoration and reconciliation between the people and God. And he will be called Emmanuel. He will be God with us. That is what the name literally translates to, God with us. God himself is going to come to his people and save them. In Isaiah 43, there's this amazing passage. It's called, in, uh, in most of our Bibles, it'll be called Israel's only Savior. And it is a promise of all God is to Israel, but all God is going to continue to be to his people. And it says things like this. It says, do not fear, for I, God, I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord. I am your God. I am the Holy One of Israel. I am your Savior. It says, you are precious and honored in my sight. I will bring your children from the east and gather you from the west. He's saying, I am your Savior, Israel. I am your God. I will be with you, and I am going to bring you from the east and for the west. It's this idea of, I'm going to bring you back to me. It's a promise for them at that moment, but it's a promise that God will always be this for his people. There's one more prophecy I want to look at in the Old Testament. It's the final prophecy made about the individual who is going to come and restore Israel. It is found in the last book of the Old Testament. It's the book of Malachi. And in the last book of the Old Testament, in the last chapter, we see this prophecy of the one who is coming, who is going to break the oppression. And it says this, it says, but for you who fear my name, this is God speaking, and he says, for you who fear my name, it's you who love me, my people, the sun, that's the shining sun, S-U-N, sun, the sun of righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. He's saying, there is a time of darkness, but there is a time of light and healing that is coming through this individual. You shall go out leaping like calves from the stall, not a farmer, never seen this. I'm told it's a very exciting thing to watch. It's very joyous. It's an idea of rejoicing. He says, behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. He says, I'm going to send someone to prepare the way for the day of the Lord. And it says, and he, the, this individual, will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers. There is going to be a time of reconciliation. This is the last prophecy we have of Emmanuel, of God coming with his people. And from their inception, by God as a people, God has been speaking to them. He has been sending them prophets with messages like these, and yes, with warnings and other messages as well. And this is a God that has, like, he literally, when he was leading them through the desert, he led them with a pillar of fire by night and a cloud by day. He was so obviously with his people. And now, all of a sudden, there's a reminder that there is going to be an even greater revelation of God being with his people, that Emmanuel is coming, that Israel will be restored and will be free, and then everything goes silent for 400 to 500 years. God goes silent. These are people still live a life. They still have a history. We know some of what happened in that time, but God, they record that God went silent. And the idea of O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, this song of lament is written inside this time of silence. 
It is a people crying out for the promise of Isaiah and the prophets. Look at the words. It says that we are mourning in exile here. They want freedom from death and from darkness. It talks about them longing for the end of the path of misery. They are calling out for Emmanuel. They are saying, God, please come and be here with us. And if you are reading your Bible, you can go from Malachi 4. So you can go for this promise that we were just talking about, you know, this, this idea of hope and of a Savior coming. And you can skip right to Matthew 1, which is the birth of Jesus. You can do that by flipping a page in your Bible. They're back to back. We take for granted what 400 to 500 years of silence would look like for these people because we know how the story is going to end. We just have to turn the page. But do we know what waiting for 400 to 500 years, do we, do we know what a 500-year wait would look like? And I want to be really clear here. This does not mean that God has abandoned his people or that he's forsaken them in any way. It's not that he stopped loving them. God made them a promise. And he is faithful to his promises. He sealed it in covenant. He is faithful to these people. It's not like he's saying, like, nope, you're not going to be my people anymore. I've stopped loving you. Promise is done, covenant done, let's just leave it like that. That's not what it's, and that's not what's happening here. But there is this agony when God is not speaking to them. These people didn't even realize how much they relied on the voice of God, how much they relied on people coming and speaking into them from God, and they are holding so closely to this promise that this idea of silence for this period of time is excruciating. You know, we talk about Advent, the Advent season, that's what we're in right now. And it's very easy to kind of say those words, and you know, so often we mark Advent by, you know, getting a lovely little calendar with delicious chocolates in it, or treats, or something like that, and it's to build the anticipation towards Christmas. But do we get what the two primary ideas, or, or that are encapsulated in Advent, do we get what they really are? Because the first and primary reason for Advent is waiting. It is a time of saying, it's not time yet. It's a time of preparation and anticipation, and I'm not really talking about the fun, good kind that's, that's great and easy to wait through. This is a time of honoring an excruciating wait. I heard one author talk about the weight of Advent, and they meant weight like W-E-I-G-H-T, the heaviness of Advent. But this heaviness is caused because Advent marks a period of waiting. W-A-I-T-I-N-G, waiting. The Israelites waited 500 years. Can you imagine telling a people, crying out for change, a people who are desperate to be free, who are waiting to be restored, and have been promised that it's going to happen? Can you imagine telling them, just suck it up, you're just going to have to wait 500 years for it? Can you imagine that? Do, you know, do we know how long 500 years really is? is. And there was no date. There's no end date given to them. They don't know when this is going to happen. Year over year, it just doesn't happen, and the silence continues. But in this time of waiting, and I want to be really clear about this as well, because the song, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, and, and the promise of God, and the season of Advent is also, is also a time of incredible hope. The people are waiting on the promise of what God is going to do, and they know that God is going to do something amazing. God promised that he would be with his people, that God would come to his people. Emmanuel, it is the idea that God is going to do something so great. It is the hope of a promise from a God who is faithful and never breaks his promises. That's why the song says rejoice. Rejoice in this promise, because God always fulfills his promise. He will do what he says he is going to do, and Emmanuel will come, and everything is going to change in that moment. The song is a song, the story of the Bible, of what Emmanuel is, is a song of God having a plan and a purpose, and it is going to be so much more than these people can possibly imagine, and it's going to exceed their expectations in every way. It is a song about how a greater revelation of God is coming.
And after 500 years of silence, something happens. A baby cries in a nearly forgotten stable in a tiny little place called Bethlehem, and everything changes. A God that created mankind, that loved his people, that watched over his people, he became one of his people. The fullness of God dwelt in human flesh. It was God literally with his people on a whole new level. Let us not forget, God was always with his people. He journeyed with them. He protected them. But this is God with his people on an entirely new and intimate level. This was him dwelling with his people. John 1, 14 says the word, it's Jesus, God in flesh, took up residence among us. I love that verse. There's so much, it's so much powerful in like one sentence. The creator choosing to become part of the creation so he could lead his people back to their creator. He came to be with them, to live with them, to sympathize and empathize with what it meant to be human, to die, to be raised from the dead, to defeat death, and to free us from the curse of sin and death in our lives. That is what we celebrate at Christmas. That birth, that revelation of God dwelling with us. We celebrate the cry that ended the silence and changed the face of the earth as we know it. And we got to be really clear here. Jesus did not meet the expectations of everyone who was expecting the Messiah or, or had an idea of what the Messiah was going to look like. Many, many people could not grasp that Jesus could be the one that they were waiting for. They're like, no, God's plan could not unfold this way. John 1, if we continue reading it, it says that, you know, it talks about Jesus coming and taking up residence with us, but it also says that he came amongst his own people, and his people didn't recognize him. They couldn't see him for what he was. They had an idea of what the Savior would look like, and Jesus wasn't it. They expected to find a king in a palace, and they got a humble baby born in poverty and obscurity. They wanted a mighty warrior to come and battle earthly powers, and instead they got a ruler who said, no, serve people, be humble, turn the other cheek. They wanted a revolutionary who was going to topple the government, and instead they got a teacher who shared a countercultural, somewhat revolutionary message. But he didn't do a revolution with guns. He did it with, with words, with challenging people about their faith and their relationship with God. They wanted a king to rule on David's throne forever, and instead they got a savior who defeated death and opened wide the gates of heaven. But for those who could see Jesus for what he was, for those who could look past what they expected and see Jesus for who he really was, that he was God with us, that he was Emmanuel, that he was fulfilling the promise that he came to heal and restore and to save and to bring people back to God. Maybe not in the way they wanted or thought, but in the way they really needed. For those people who saw Jesus as that, they encountered God with them. They found Emmanuel. And it says that it, it says in John that for those who could see Jesus for what he really was, they got the right to become sons and daughters of God. God's chosen people was no longer based on a bloodline. It was based on people who could see what Jesus really was and accept that and follow after him. The people found a savior to ransom them, to pay the penalty for their sins they could not pay. They found a Lord who didn't abolish the law, but he upheld the law, and he showed people how to be righteous, not through their own actions, but through faith and a relationship with God. He brought people from feeling alone and exiled into a new family, just like we talked about, not based on a bloodline, but based on people who believed that the blood sacrifice of Jesus was their saving grace, that that was their savior, and that that sacrifice was available to all people. Emmanuel, God with us. He came, he lived, he died, he rose, and he saved. And you might be sitting here this morning and you're going, well, that is a great summation of the Old Testament and leading up to the Christmas story, and now I know what Emmanuel is, but what does this mean for me? You know, how does this 
translate to today. And this is where I really want to go with this. Because I think, because O Come, O Come, Emmanuel is written very purposely in Old Testament language, we think somehow the song doesn't apply to us anymore. We're like, well, yes, Emmanuel came, God came, God is with us. Okay, it's done, the story is over. And we don't see ourselves as a people that are crying out for a savior. But when I look around this city, and when I look around this country, and this continent, and the world, all I see is a people who are crying out for a savior. People who are crying out for freedom, to be released from whatever kind of oppression they are under. That's all I see when I look at this world. I see people in desperate need for a savior, for Emmanuel. And this song, the, the season of Advent, this song, it's really about either waiting or hoping. And I think that all of us are either waiting or hoping, and some of us might be both. I mean, maybe you're here, and you feel like the Israelites of the Old Testament, that story that I shared, and you know the words of God, you know that God loves you, you know that God is with you, but you are trapped in this cycle of living life your own way, and God is trying to get your attention. He is calling out to you, but you don't know how to make your way back to God, and you feel far away, and, and you don't know what to do, and, and this cycle isn't working for you anymore, and you want freedom from this cycle. Maybe you're here, and you look around the world, and all you see is darkness, and it seems so overwhelming, and you looked at what happened in Paris about a month ago, and you looked at another mass shooting in the States a few weeks ago, and you hear words like ISIS and Syria and terrorism, and I could have chosen a hundred other words, and when you look at that, the darkness feels so overwhelming, and you feel hopeless by the oppression that you see, and that is a burden to you, and, and you don't even see how God could be working in all of this. Maybe you're here in your struggle, your weight, your hope. Maybe it's a lot more personal. Maybe you or someone you love are fighting a really difficult battle with cancer. You know, maybe this Christmas someone you love is going to be in the hospital, and that's where you're going to celebrate with them. Maybe this is the year where you've lost a loved one to death, to circumstance. I don't know what it might be, but a mom, a dad, a child, a spouse. You have to live this new reality without someone in your life, and you don't know what that's going to look like. Maybe a, a job is gone, a relationship is shattered. I don't know what the circumstances are, but for, this, for you this year, maybe you just feel like Christmas is going to be a time that's really lonely and really painful. And I don't know if what I'm going to say is going to make it better at all, but what I'm here telling you or trying to tell you is that this is just a glimpse of Advent. You are in a time of your life where you are glimpsing the weight of Advent, and you feel that weight of waiting, and you are getting a glimpse into the reality that Jesus, the Savior, God with us, is really what we are all after, that Jesus is the promise and he is our savior in our time of waiting. And that might not mean that circumstances are going to change. They, they might not. I can't, I can't promise that. But he is the promise. He is the hope that can get you through that waiting. He can empathize with us as humans. And he can change everything. Emmanuel is a message of hope ultimately. It really, really is. And it's not was a message of hope. It is a message of hope. It is not a hope of the past. It is a hope of our present and our future because Jesus was a once and for all deal. What he did, the work he did, the healing, the saving, the restoration, the reconciliation with God, the chance to have a relationship with God, it is available to all of us because God was with us and came to this earth. We are not waiting for a Savior anymore. We might feel like we are, but the Savior is available to us all today. The promise of Isaiah 43, the one that we read earlier, that is available to us. The God who wants to walk with you through life's most difficult circumstances, who wants to see you through the fire, and see that you don't get consumed by it. The one that wants to walk with you through the deep waters and not drown under them. He 
wants to be with you. That promise is still true and alive today. God is still with us. Jesus may not be present in physical form, but Emmanuel, God with us, is not limited by a physical form. It is a truth that is still happening and still alive right now here today. John 14, it's a story of Jesus and his disciples, and Jesus is about to leave. He did leave this earth after he rose again. And as he is leaving, he tells his disciples that you are not going to be left alone. I will not leave you alone. I will make sure that there is someone who is still with you. And he says, I will give you another, an advocate to help with you and to be with you forever. And it is the spirit of truth. I will not leave you as orphans. For those who believe we, he's talking about himself, the Father, and this promised one, we will come and we will make our home with you. The advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have shared with you. Jesus is saying in this moment, there is a further revelation to God happening here. Something incredible is going to happen. The Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, is going to be so close to you, is going to be God with you so closely, that he is literally going to dwell inside of you. He is going to make his home inside of you. He is going to instruct you and teach you and remind you and guide you. He's going to stir up affection in your heart for Jesus, and he's going to remind you how God wants you to live. There is no more silence. No more silence. God can literally dwell inside of us. Emmanuel has come, and everything has changed. We have the hope of a Savior who already rescued and redeemed us, and we have the Holy Spirit, God literally dwelling inside of us if we ask him to, and that is a reason to rejoice. Like the song says, rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel has come. God is with us. I had mentioned earlier today that it's easy, it's easy-ish, let's say, to make light of the waiting that Israel went through because we know how the story is going to end. It ends with a baby crying, and that cry changed the world. It ended with Emmanuel. And I want to be really careful here because I'm not here to minimize the struggle of any person. I am not here to say that your circumstances will magically be happy, and I don't want, to, don't want to trivialize anyone who's in a period of waiting. I have been in periods of waiting myself, and I know how difficult they can be, so please don't think I'm, I'm trying to minimize what anyone is going through. But we are in a very interesting time right now because we are in a new season of Advent. God is still with us. The Holy Spirit is a present reality. We can have God literally dwelling inside of us. And yet this is still a time of waiting for us. When Jesus left this earth, he said, one day I am going to come back and God is going to do something great. There is going to be a further revelation of God yet to come. God is still revealing his story. And what's really interesting about this Advent that we're in, this waiting for Jesus to return, is that we know how the story is going to end. That God, a God who was and is and is to come, Emmanuel, God with us, he is going to win in the end. Jesus is going to return and reconciliation and restoration, we're gonna see it on a whole new level, but the victory is God's, it is his. We know how it's going to end. And we don't know when and we don't know how. People who tell you that they know when and how are not telling you the truth, just so you know. But we know that a cry is going to come and then that cry is going to change everything. Revelation 21.3, It's um, written by a man named John who sees the return of Jesus. He is given a glimpse of that revelation. It says, then I, John, I heard a loud voice, a cry from the throne and said, look, God's dwelling is with men. He will live with them. 
He, they will be his people, and God himself will be with them, and he will be their God. Through Jesus, we have the promise of eternity in heaven with God. This is the culmination of the everlasting covenant we saw that began in Genesis 12, that we are his people, and he is our God from the creation of the world to a God who warned and guided and promised his people to a stable in Bethlehem, to a cross, to a tomb, to the promise of the Holy Spirit who was going to come and dwell with us, to the promise that Jesus is one day returning and making a life with him forever, a reality, Emmanuel, God with us, is our reality. It can be our reality. God is with us. Let's pray. Father God, we, we thank you for, for these words, for this promise. Saying thank you doesn't even seem like enough. This, this, this revelation of Emmanuel, of you being with us, God, of you coming to dwell with us, to sympathize with us as humans, to die for our sins and to be raised from the dead, to defeat death and to be victorious over it. God, we, we thank you for that. We thank you for the truth of these words. We thank you that you have opened wide the gates of heaven, God, and that anyone who comes to you can find you as their savior. That, their whole, that your Holy Spirit can come and dwell inside of us, that Emmanuel will be so present, so close, that you could literally dwell inside of us. God, we thank you for this reality. God, I pray for, for anyone here who's in a season of Advent who is feeling the weight of waiting, and that weight is excruciating. God, I pray that you will just give them the sense of all that you are, the sense that you are the Savior, that you are with them in their time of waiting, that this does not have to be a time of silence, that you will be with them, that you will speak to them, that you will guide them, that you will comfort them, that you have come. We thank you for the reality of God with us and all that that has meant and means and will mean to come, God. We pray all this in your Son's holy, holy name. Amen. I stand with so many questions, but you know all of the answers. And whether this side of heaven
Thanks so much for listening. We hope you enjoyed this message. To hear it again or other messages, please visit us at lakesidechurch.ca.